Uh, so that was kind of scary. <laughs> so I'm going to tell a joke. Uh, okay, Keith Alexander walks into a bar. Bartender says, what would you like? He says, I would like a beer. Bartender says, foreign or domestic? Keith says, what's the difference? <laughs> I didn't make that up. I was not trying to credit for it, but I share the gospel. So Chris, I think, pretty effectively laid out how... Um, how the how you know corporate and government forces have essentially constricted the space of democracy, whereby or you know to the point where the courts are not really a good avenue for challenging these programs. Um, the legislature is clearly bought and sold both in states and at the federal level. So what are we going to do? Um, you know, Chris gave the examples of whistleblowers, of uh, journalists like Glenn Greenwald, who are called activists, which I think is meant to be a slur, um, and and I think that. You know, those people are in positions, whether you're, whether it's a hacker like Jeremy Hammond who has, you know, incredible technical skills and can do something like that, most people can't. Whether you're Edward Snowden and you're in a position of power where you have access to troves of data that the vast majority of people in the world do not have access to, most of us are never going to be in those situations, right? But we can, in fact, exert pressure on the system by simply going out into the street and protesting it. Civil disobedience is a great uh, way to do that, but you don't actually have to break the law in order to make an impact. I think that that's pretty clear um, here in New York City, given what happened with the Occupy movement here. And I'll just say as an aside that when I was coming in here, I read the news that Ray Kelly has been offered a job at <coughs> J.P. Morgan Chase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know he he got a major. He's going to be making millions of dollars. His offer was in the seven seven figures. They haven't disclosed exactly how much it is, but uh, it's clear that you know if the police serve in the interest of the banks instead of the people, they get rewarded not only. Uh, by receiving $5 million from J.P. Morgan Chase, which the NYPD did a number of years ago um, as a grant. But also, when the police chief or commissioner retires, he then gets a major severance package in the form of a very cushy job on Wall Street. Um, so, you know, I think it's actually really critical to, to go back to 1917, um, which is when the Espionage Act was passed. The Espionage Act is what uh, Edward Snowden is being charged with. It's what I believe all eight of the whistleblowers that the Obama administration is prosecuting are being charged with. The Espionage Act is a bullshit law. Um, it was passed during the height of the Red Scare uh, after World War I in a time wherein you know, there were actual radicals in the United States, people who were blowing things up, for example, Wall Street. Um, and it was, it, was, uh, it was a time during which there was real socialist uh, agitation in this country. There were real anarchist movements that were threatening banks and Wall Street in very real ways, like I said, by blowing them up. Um, that simply is not the case anymore. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> the fact that the Occupy movement threatened Wall Street to the degree that police would pepper spray, you know, young white women on national television is just, it's, it's really incredible to see how far we've come in a hundred years, or just less than a hundred years. Um, but I think it's important to go back to 1917, in part because we're in a very similar moment right now. There's hard, you know, the resistance is not, is not the same. We do not live in a world today in which there are Emma Goldman's or Mother Jones's or you know any number of the other people who were agitating very radically at that time. But we do live in a similar time in terms of government repression. Um, so you know a lot of people trace this new uh, era of government repression to 9/11, but in fact it goes back slightly earlier than that to the Clinton administration actually, um, which passed something called the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. How many people in this room know what that is? Okay, it's a really big deal. You should look it up. In that law, there's a, there's a piece of that law which says that providing material support to terrorism is a federal crime. Um, and we saw what happens when the government actually goes after people under uh, the material support clause, which was um, ruled constitutional by the Supreme Court a couple of years ago in a case called Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project. Um, essentially, long story short, the government has carved out a massive exemption to the First Amendment. Um, it, it appears as if, right now, that exemption only applies to Muslims. Um, so take, for example, the case of Tariq Mahana. How many people in here have heard of Tariq? Okay, so Tariq uh, was a Boston area student. He lived in, I think, like Waltham or some, you know, some suburb of Boston um, with his family, grew up in Boston. 
um, and was an anti-war activist. He's about the same age as I am, actually, so this story is really resonant for me because I, too, was an anti-war activist during that time. Um, so at the age of 16, he was 16 when the FBI started surveilling him. In fact, um, they used a Patriot Act power called a sneak and peek to go into his house, and we only know this because he's now been prosecuted and he's been locked up for 18, or he's been sentenced to 18 years in prison, in Supermax prison, um, as a terrorist. Uh, so they started spying on him when he was 16 years old, used a sneak and peek, which is a special warrant authorized under the Patriot Act, to go into, into his house while his family was on vacation and install bugging equipment and search all of his things. Um, and they spied on him for eight full years. The FBI had a major case looking at this guy. He was 16 years old, again, when they started spying on him. Um, the reason they looked into him was because of his anti-war activism, protesting the Afghanistan invasion in particular. Um, essentially what the government did with Tarek is scare a jury enough to convince a jury to put someone in prison for 18 years for doing all the things I'm about to describe. Translating documents that were found on the internet, posting videos to YouTube, and going to Yemen for a week. This is what he, this is what he did. He also lied to federal to FBI agents, and this is something that you should never ever do ever. Um, do not talk to the FBI. It's really important that you know that because if they they will twist whatever you say to use it against you, and you can be locked up for five years in federal prison um, simply for talking to them. So anyway, Tarek is now in prison for 18 years, federal prison for the crime of again translating publicly available documents that were on the internet during. I mean. You really should look into the prosecution of Tarek Mahana, if only to read some of the statements that the government, the government's prosecutors made in court, because they're really frightening. They basically like held up pictures of the towers, you know, people jumping out of the towers on 9/11, you know, read speeches from Bin Laden indicting the U.S., and then tried to essentially make the jury believe that Tarek Mahana was responsible for an ideology for for you know for talking to people, essentially, about an ideology that the government doesn't like, which is, you know, Islamic terrorism, Al-Qaeda, whatever. Um, it's also really, really important to note that during his trial, his, pro his defense attorneys were not allowed to discuss the First Amendment. Um, they tried, because clearly it was their major defense, right, that their client couldn't be charged with material support for terrorism simply for translating documents, posting videos onto YouTube. And the prosecution objected and said that because in part of Holder v. Humanitarian Law, the, the piece of the First Amendment that the government had carved out in that Supreme Court decision, that, his, that the defense attorneys could not even mention the First Amendment. Not once. So, okay, so that's the backdrop. Now, you know, over the past 12 years, a lot more has changed. So, so Clinton passed the Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act in 1996. That was a really bad law. It still is. It's a really big deal. We know about the Patriot Act. We know about the FISA Amendments Act. You know, now we know, thanks to Edward Snowden, that all of the things that people like Bill Binney and Thomas Drake and other whistleblowers have been saying for years are true, and then some. Um, but a lot of people don't know that what's, go what's gone on over the past 12 years has been not only sort of the, you know, <coughs> like amping up the surveillance state on steroids thanks to the war on terror and this new bo bogeyman that the U.S. government can um, convince everybody to be afraid of, but there's also been a real trickle down from the national security state down to the state and local level. And, and I work in the state of Massachusetts, I work in Boston, um, and that's, that's really the focus of my work. Uh, is trying to look into the ways in which, you know, technologies and laws have changed at the state and local level, enabling a kind of surveillance that is more pervasive and more damaging than anything that we've ever seen before. I mean, most people in this room probably know about COINTELPRO, about, you know, even Operation Shamrock, which was the NSA's program in the 1970s to spy on the communications of anti-war activists in the United States. So it's not new, you know. The NYPD and major city police departments have had red squads for years, dating back, you know, 100 years. It's not new that the police are interested in spying on dissent or, you know, busting up or infiltrating democratic uh, reform movements. What is new, however, is that a series of laws have been passed at the state level as well as at the federal level, as well as technology and money coming from places like the Department of Homeland Security, which again is a creature of 9-11, and the Department of Justice to 
provide state and local police departments with the kinds of surveillance technologies that, you know, really in most countries only militaries have. So here in New York, you guys obviously know about this. And I think, you know, in New York City, you really have a critical opportunity and in, to some degree, I believe, a responsibility to fight the NYPD, really. Um, because what happens in New York, what happens at the NYPD has the effect of, you know, trickling down again to state and local police departments all throughout the country, especially in major metro areas, um, but even in, you know, really remote places as well. Um, so I just want to give you one example, because my time is running out, of a way in which uh, local laws that have passed over the past five years enabled the same kind of state surveillance of activists that's going on at the federal level. So how many people in here know about Jake Applebaum? Computer security guy, activist, okay. So Jake was, his accounts were served with a national security letter a number of years ago, and NSL is basically a secret subpoena that the FBI files with Google, you know, Comcast, whoever, uh, to get our records. You probably will never find out about this if it happens to you, but somehow Jake found out. I can't remember how, but anyway, he found out. Um, and subpoenas, I don't know if you guys are lawyers or you know, but subpoenas are just pieces of paper that prosecutors write on and they give it to someone. No judge ever sees this piece of paper. Um, there's no oversight of this process whatsoever. So that's, it's scary that the FBI can do that, for sure. But there are only, I think, like 25,000 FBI agents in the country or something like that. There are over a million cops in this country. Um, and now, in many, many states, in Massachusetts, I believe also in New York, and I think actually in most states now, there are, there are statutes called administrative subpoena statutes. And these statutes grant local and state prosecutors the same power that NSLs grant federal prosecutors in the FBI. The only difference is that under administrative subpoena laws at the state level, um, there isn't supposed to be a gag order, which means you know the, the, when the FBI serves an NSL to someone, up until very recently when a judge found this practice unconstitutional, um, the FBI said, you can't tell anybody, and if you do, you're gonna go to jail. Um, for, you know, and they obviously meant you can't tell the target of the subpoena that the subpoena exists. That is the only difference between the administrative subpoena statutes at the state and local level and the NSLs under the Patriot Act at the federal level. Um, so how does this get used? Well, a couple of years ago in Boston, um, we had a Boston Occupy movement, like every other city in the country, and the cops raided some place and arrested a bunch of people, and some people on the internet were really pissed off about it. And so somebody doxed the cops. Um, somebody put a list of publicly available information about Boston police officers onto a spreadsheet and put it online that is completely legal under the First Amendment. He did not hack anything. You know, no information was compromised from secure systems. It was all publicly available. Not a very nice thing to do. Definitely pissed off the cops a lot. So I wouldn't advise that you do this. Um, but so what happened was he, uh, a, 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 an assistant district attorney in the Suffolk County Prosecutor's Office um, sent a, an administrative subpoena to Twitter to find out who this person was because he, he used like an anonymous Twitter handle. Um, and Twitter is one of the only companies that discloses the existence of these subpoenas to the targets. So Twitter wrote this person an email and said, just so you know, we got an order for your information. We're not going to disclose it to them until you tell us that you're not going to try to fight it. So this person came to us at the ACLU of Massachusetts and said, I don't want my anonymity to be um, you know, destroyed. I would like to remain anonymous. I don't think I broke the law. So we tried to fight it. We lost. Um, we lost because of something called the third party doctrine. Do you guys know what that is? Oh man, it is like the number one problem in the law today. Do you agree, Michael? Absolutely. <laughs> so the third party doctrine essentially says that if I give something to Chris, who works at Comcast, for example, my name, my billing rec, you know, my credit card number, whatever, every phone number I call, etc., um, I have no right to privacy in that information ever again. Um, that's what it means. That if you give anything to a third party, you have completely done away with your right to protect that information. So the third party doctrine actually governs a whole lot of the NSA's surveillance programs. Um, it also governs stuff like the administrative subpoena statute here in, uh, rather in Massachusetts. And that's what happened in our court case. The judge said, well, the only, the only person who has a right to come into this courtroom and try to stop this information from being disclosed is Twitter.com. And Twitter.com's not here, so get out of my court. Um, you have no right to your own information if it's held by these third-party companies. So having said that, I mean, I could talk for like a million years, but... <laughs> 
I just I want to finish by saying that this is a really scary time. I mean, it really is. You know, the government is continuing to lock up people without charge or trial on Gitmo, blowing up people in so-called signature strikes, which the CIA actually calls crowd killings, you should know, um, which is basically, you know, they blow up an area in Pakistan or wherever because they think that there might be terrorists there or something. Uh, they don't even know the names of the people they've killed. Um, you know, the drug war is ravishing this country seemingly with no end in sight, even though it's increasingly politically unpopular. Activists are being locked up. You know, the UK is calling Glenn Greenwald's partner a terrorist, um, and actually, I believe, charging him in, to some degree, right? Is I don't think he was charged. He hasn't been charged yet, but there's an investigation. Okay, okay, so they, yeah. They've they're opened a terrorism investigation. Okay, so yeah, it's a scary time when, when the so-called democracies of the supposed, you know, of the so-called West are acting basically like the Egyptian, you know, secret police of 10 years ago. Um, I think we need to take heed from Edward Snowden and not be afraid. Because really, we're really facing a situation in which we have like two options. We can either completely buck the security state and just say, you know, we're not afraid of you. We're not going to accept all this bullshit that you feed us constantly. We're not interested in the mainstream media's narratives about these problems. We're going to like seek out independent media. We're going to protest in the streets when we don't like something. You know, we're going to take the mic from Ray Kelly when he goes to Brown University and whatever. Um, <laughs> we can do that and then perhaps look back in 20 or 30 years and think, oh man, I'm so glad we dodged that bullet. Or we will look back in 30 years and our kids, if we have them, will say, what the fuck did you do? Because we will be in a really, really bad situation. So those are really the only two possibilities. And, and, and I think the critical thing for us is to not be afraid. Just don't, don't be afraid. You know, Edward Snowden has risked his entire life. I mean, he probably will not have a life. Um, it, that actually depends on us too. You know, we should take courage from Edward Snowden's courage and fight the state in part to, to, help, to help him, but also to like, you know, protect the possibility of a future in which we live in something like an open and democratic society. Thanks.